Hi everybody, welcome to another podcast in Mrs. series of podcasts and webinars. In this series, we bring to you some interesting supply chain innovations and solutions from Malaysia, Southeast Asia, and outside the region. I'm Shardul Fadnis, Mrs. Director of Research and a member of its faculty. Today, I'm going to interview Mr. Syazwan Mokhtar, the General Manager of the Lost Food Project of Kuala Lumpur. So thanks everybody for joining us today. Today I have uh, with me Mr. Siaz Mokhtar. Siaz is the general manager of the Lost Food Project. And uh, today we are going to talk about the effect of COVID-19 pandemic as the movement control order has had on the Lost Food Project's operations, as well as what they have done to adapt to this, uh, this shock that we have seen in our supply chain. So Siaz, again, thank you very much for joining me today. Thank you for having me. It's, it's my pleasure. And before we start looking at the impact of the MCO, could you tell me a little bit about the Lost Food Project and the work that you have been doing in Malaysia? Hi again. Uh, so basically, the Lost Food Project is a um, food bank non-profit uh, organization or a non-governmental organization. We exist to rescue edible and nutritious food before it is disposed of into landfill. Uh, and we redistribute those uh, food to charities and B40 communities that are most in need at the moment within the Klang Valley and Kuala Lumpur area, also in Selangor and some uh, little operations in Johor as well. So we do this daily. Basically, our operations are daily. We rescue food, be it from wet market, wholesalers, manufacturers, uh, supermarkets. Um, so before the COVID-19 MCO situation, for example, we were rescuing almost uh, 10 to 15 tons of food um, weekly, which we distribute weekly to up to about 40,000 meals provided to about 10 to, 10 to 15,000 people. Um, our, we work as, a, as an umbrella charity whereby we have several quite a lot of uh, charities registered under us. Uh, right now, we total up to about 55, 56 charities, uh, catering to about 6,700 6, uh, people, or almost close to about 7,000 people from these different charities. These charities can range from uh, homeless charities, or orphanages, old folks' home, disab disabled uh, people, uh, and many other schools as well. So we distribute food to these charities uh, weekly, and we also have arrangements with uh, several B40 community uh, PPRs, for example, the ones in uh, Lembah Pantai and Tamamulati Gombak. These are catered to family, individual families, uh, can range up to between 5,000 to 20,000 people per PPR and per community. Uh, so these are our operations basically before the, the pandemic. We, were, we relied mostly on uh, volunteers and also donations uh, from, again, from surplus food, which were uh, saved before being disposed to landfill. Yes, thank you very much for that uh, description. So what really intrigues me or what I really find interesting about the Lost Food Project is that you have a social mission, both on the demand side as well as the supply side of the supply chain. So you you mentioned use the term rescue food, right? So it's <coughs> preventing the food spoilage or food wastage that is happening, uh, I guess, at the grocery stores and restaurants and so on. And you're connecting that through a very intelligent supply chain that you have created with the people who need who need food. And these are the B40 communities and PPRs and so on. And you mentioned about 40,000 meals per week. That's a massive scope of operations. So why don't we begin with the shock on the demand side itself? Can you tell me how the movement control order and the pandemic have affected the demand for your service? Right. So um, yeah, you like, rightly mentioned that before the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, we were flushed with um, surplus food, for example. We uh, took out an SW Corp study 3,000 tons of edible food were wasted daily uh, in Malaysia. Um, of course, this does not just cover manufacturers or supermarkets and restaurants. It might, might also relate to you know what we waste daily uh, household, for example, in our household. So, but 
that is how it was before. And suddenly, after the COVID pandemic situation, we're talking about food insecurity being a major issue. So there's a disconnect there between such a large amount of wasted food before the pandemic, and suddenly we, we there is a huge uh, food insecurity problem in Malaysia. Um, the demand for the Lost Food Project exponentially increased since uh, the pandemic. However, our capacity has decreased because of the lack of surplus food that we're getting. Um, we're talking about getting 10 to 15 tons of food. Like for example, we were getting uh, about 10 to 12 tons of um, vegetables from Pasaburung Kuala Lumpur, Pasaburung Selayang before the, the, the MCO. Uh, once the pandemic was uh, declared by WHO and we discussed this over, over a meeting uh, among the, the Lost Food Project Committee, and we decided to halt our operations with Pasaburung Selayang just to, you know, uh, in order to keep our health and safety in check, given the number of cases uh, that were back then that were reported, uh, especially with the Tablih cluster. So when we halt our operations with Pasaburung Selayang, we're talking about 10 to 12 tons of food being diminished from our weekly capacity. Um, and this has given rise to a, a real need to source for food from other uh, sources as well. So we're talking about supermarkets and manufacturers uh, hoping for donations or even surplus uh, being, buying food from uh, the, the, the supermarkets and wholesalers. Um, however, given the circumstances, given the situation, we've also seen an increase in terms of the demand from the B40 communities. The lack of um, access to food uh, with the restrictions, the lack of um, financial uh, backing, for example, for a lot of our charities and also a lot of our beef of the community beneficiaries were daily wage earners and therefore they were uh, kind of um, disallowed in terms of just having, you know, uh, the financial security to, to last uh, the crisis. And this has given rise to a lot of demands from them. We were getting distress calls daily now from different members of the community. But our operations have always been, always been kind of fixed in terms of who we provide our food to. We were providing food to our 55, 56 charities. Uh, and also we were providing food for our arranged, um, I guess, uh, deals with the PPRs like Lomba Pantai and Gombak and the one in Malawati, Taman Malawati Gombak. And therefore, we were quite limited in terms of what we can provide um, just, in, you know, uh, over the period. We, were, we started out with, again, zero uh, surplus food. We, we ran a campaign which um, wanted, uh, we, we wanted to the public to know what we are doing. And so we ran a funding campaign also for donation food drive, food donation drive, sorry. And this has been received with such overwhelming support from the public and the corporate. Uh, when we started, we were able only to provide like 300 to 500 people with meals uh, due to the amount of food that we have in our stock uh, diminished quite heavily, like I mentioned. And since the campaign was held, we've been getting a lot of support. We've been getting a lot of food coming in. Uh, a lot of manufacturers were able to come and kind of donate food. Um, be it surplus or even just to donate food which they have in stock ready uh, to provide for the uh, our beneficiaries. Since uh, the start of the COVID operations, I mentioned we had to target like our most vulnerable charities, our most vulnerable, economically vulnerable members of the beneficiaries, uh, 300 to 400 again as I mentioned, but we've increased that. Uh, now we've provided to more than 10,000 beneficiaries be it from our charities, which increased from eight charities to about 30 charities. And also um, from two PPRs, we've not, we're now provided to more than four PPRs, you know, five PPRs in fact, uh, B40 communities um, in Lumba Pantai, uh, Gombak, City Wangsa, Pandan, even PJ areas. And um, this has been due to the fact that we've been getting a lot of support. So the demand side has definitely increased and we, we, I mean, even though we have increased our supply now, we've, been in, we've increased our offerings as well, but we have not been able to meet all the demands um, 
And earlier this morning, even I, I just had a meeting with uh, different NGOs talking about pl uh, plugging the gaps um, in terms of you know, providing food to those who are in need. Uh, we're talking about refugees, for example, not getting uh, the attention that they also deserve during this time of crisis. And this has uh, re given rise also to a lot of coordination among different members of NGOs and the government and rep people's representatives and, uh, you know, just anyone involved in providing this kind of service to the public. Yes, that is uh, really heartening to hear that people have, uh, public has stepped in, companies have stepped in to support you when the surplus, the food supply of surplus food suddenly diminished significantly for for your operations as you decided not to uh, obtain food from the Pasar Borong Salayang and then um, as other people have chipped in. Uh, I assume this donation drive is still going on, is that right? Yes, the donation drive is still going on. We are still trying to expand our beneficiary base. Uh, hopefully we can reach a lot more people. What we do with the donations is that we we, we now have to buy food um, different from operations previously where we rescue surplus food. Uh, and buying food requires, of course, uh, a lot of funding. And um, we buy food that caters to families as well as our charities. So, for example, when uh, we get our funding from a particular corporate entity, we are able to feed our charity for a month with a food hamper that costs about 600 to 700 ringgit. Similarly, with families, we have uh, kind donors who are providing enough funding to feed uh, a family of five uh, with a food hamper that costs around 70 to 80 ringgit. That will last them about three to four weeks, hopefully. And uh, we are trying to expand this to a lot more people, a lot more beneficiaries uh, over the course of the next uh, month or two. What would be a way for someone to contribute to your cause? Okay, so we do have a website, the lostfoodproject.org. Um, you can also visit our Instagram and Facebook pages, um, the Lost Food at the Lost Food Project, which we update almost daily. Uh, we we try to be transparent in terms of what we provide, and we we appreciate all the support and all the donations that we receive, and we try to um, provide uh, appreciation posts uh, to those who who help us. Um, of course, you can, there, are, there are different ways in which anyone can support us. We have our bank account. Uh, we, like, visit our website and our social media accounts to, to view our, the, the, the bank account number. We also have a QR code as well. We have our Simply Giving page, uh, which has been a good source of uh, donate, do, uh, fund, uh, campaign, donation campaign. We also have, um, for those who use this Bytes app, um, bites is for uh, the food to be uh, like if you uh, so this bites app have points that which you can convert into donation to TLFP. Similarly with uh, CIMB, they also have point system which you can convert into donation for uh, the Lost Food Project. You can visit the respective uh, websites as well. So that's Maybank and CIMB for for that particular uh, arrangement. And also, you know, those who like to donate food, uh, especially companies, manufacturers, uh, suppliers, we are happy to accept them. We distribute them. We provide you a report in terms of our dis distribution. Uh, we show who does it go to. And we, we try to do this as transparent and, and, and with greater accountability, a greatest accountability that we can provide. Um, this food will dis be distributed uh, fairly uh, among our beneficiaries. So we try not to over provide to our beneficiaries for example if a charity has received a certain amount of donation we then try to uh, distribute those uh, the other goods and products to other charities and similarly with our arrangement with b40 communities our uh, community partners at the pprs and cluster homes and flats and low cost housing we try to provide the the right you know goods to them so if a, if a house doesn't need uh, a diaper, uh, I'm sorry, it doesn't need uh, formula milk, for example, for the kids, we try not to provide them. And those who want formula milk can request and we will try to provide.
So it goes uh, in in a very systematic way and strategic way so that um, we can provide to those in need do things that they need. What is the typical process? So do you have your own trucks that pick up food from these different sources and deliver to, you mentioned about 55 charities. Uh, what is the time between, from the time you pick the food up until it is delivered to the beneficiaries? So what does that whole process look like? Our operations are very dynamic in that sense. Uh, we, we try to cater to uh, the situation as well. So we do have trucks uh, doing it to us, uh, from members of the corporate. We have three trucks, uh, a small one-ton truck up to a five-ton truck. Uh, if we receive, if we go to, for example, um, okay, different sources, for example, when we go to Pasar Borong Selayang, Pasar Borong Kuala Lumpur, uh, we, we, we go to PBKL three times a week. This is before COVID. We go to PBKL three times a week, um, meet with the, the vendors there because we have to deal with each vendors. We don't deal with a single consortium, for example. So we collect from each vendors that are able to provide with us with their surplus vegetable that they do not sell on the day because they, they receive their supply daily. So those that they are not able to sell on the day, they, they usually throw them away. So we're talking about daily, you can collect within, collect within three, two to three and a half tons of vegetables, which would otherwise go to landfill. landfill. So what we do is we, we we drive our truck at two Pasaburon KL. We meet we meet with each vendor and then we try to pro and then we collect them and bring it back to our warehouse or we bring it directly to the B40 community. So on Monday and Friday we, we send the vegetables directly to uh, Gomba and also Lembah Pantai respectively. And on Wednesday we collect and sort the food at our warehouse. We clean them up, we do the necessary to make sure that it is um, ready to be given to our charities and then we sort them and provide and give them to our charities on Thursday. So this has to be done overnight. Um, since these are perishable items, it is the turnaround is very quick. We also weekly, uh, almost daily, in fact, we drive around to our food partners. We're talking about supermarkets um, which uh, have surplus food. So we're talking about the likes of Giant, for example. Uh, the chain markets and the food purveyor and we collect all this food uh, which vary in terms of just the amount and the, the, the weight that we are able to collect daily and then we bring it back to our warehouse for sorting which later on we redistribute to our charities. For SM, FMCG for example you mentioned uh, we do receive from the likes of uh, Nestle, DKSH, uh, Unilever even non-food items from PNG, for example, um, Nestle and all. So we, we, we collect all these items. Sometimes we pick up from the respective warehouse or distribution center. And sometimes they do send it to our warehouse as well. So, and once that is, pro you know, we have two warehouses of our own, which we rent, one in Jalam as a staging warehouse where we keep the more, uh, the longer, um, you know, expiry date ones, and also our, our main warehouse in uh, Jalan Wisma Putra. Basically, we rent from the Red Crescent uh, Society. We sort them out and we try to provide as soon as possible. So we uh, we take note of the expiry dates for each of the items. We note uh, all the items that we receive. We take their weight. Uh, we measure them and ensure that uh, they are fit for purpose. And then we sort them and provide, uh, we distribute to our charities or our PPRs. So I also mentioned that we receive non-food items um, like diapers and uh, shaving uh, products, hygiene products, um, you know, uh, dishwashers and all the likes. So these are also provide, provided to us and we then distribute them to our B40 communities. We usually receive, you, you mentioned, for example, some of these are surplus items. Sometimes it really is about defects as well. Some of the items are just defects of labeling, for example. So we have 17 pallets uh, carrying thousands of products which are defective due to labeling issues. So, and they provide it to us, which we then donate to our beneficiaries. Each of our um, 
partners, whether it's our food partners or charity partners or community partners, uh, made to sign, we, we sign contract with them. We sign an agreement with them to ensure that each party is uh, protected uh, of any liability uh, and we also try to abide by certain requirements by each party. Uh, for example, manufacturers might you know, uh, specify that they do not want their items to be sold to black markets and all that. So we try to make sure that our charity partners and our community partners adhere to these conditions as well uh, to ensure that we do not, um, you know, our operations do not affect anyone's um, operations. Yep. Yes, that is quite an extensive uh, operation. So you have to pick the food and uh, maybe dry goods up from these different uh, sources, uh, whole food, uh, the wholesale markets or the FMCG manufacturers, their warehouses. Then there is the sorting operation that is taking place in your warehouses. And then there is delivery to the charities and the PPRs and so on. So it needs a lot of people to do this work. But I also understand that you rely extensively on volunteers. Can you tell us a little bit about that, that side of the story of that side of your operations? It's the volunteer army that is that is the backbone of your operations, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. Um, it's it's quite interesting how in fact how the how the Lost Food Project was started is um, you know we had Suzanne Mooney who is our founder just picking up food from uh, supermarket Jasons back then in Bangsa. Um, collecting ripe bananas, which the store manager would, would, were already kind of uh, throwing away. So it started back then, and then her network of uh, friends and acquaintances just started collecting food from different supermarkets and sorting them out uh, at the back of their car or the trunk of their car, and then distributing it to a small number of charities that they, they, they know of. And then it started from there, they, they, they began to work um, almost full time as volunteers working um, day in, day out, collecting and distributing food. When we started to grow as an organization, as a society, we, there is a need for several, of course, full time members, uh, staff members. So um, right now we are operating just just the full-time staff members have about four of us. Uh, we have a, a, a truck driver. We also have a warehouse manager, myself as the general manager, and also a business admin, uh, which helps out with admin duties and also legal duties as well. Um, so the four of us are the only ones getting paid uh, monthly salary. The rest are volunteers, and we're talking about uh, we are we have about eight hundred registered volunteers. About Close to 200 of them are active, active doing volunteer work, for example, sorting food, delivering food, collecting food. Uh, but we do have a core number of people working somewhat in management. Uh, as I would say, there are 12, 20, about 20 leader units of volunteers doing things from procurement, charity liaison, uh, marketing, communication. They also, some of them are also committee members. Um, uh, they do warehouse management as well. So these 20, 20 to 25 core leader volunteers, lead volunteers, uh, work daily as well. They, they, it's almost non-stop for them as, as much as I do my work. Uh, that's, you know, the, the amount of work that they do is as, as, uh, as extensive as that. So, but they are not getting paid a single cent. And um, these are our, basically our heart and soul of the, the Lost Food Project. Uh, what we operate, just you know, providing 40,000 meals weekly, providing um, the B40 community with uh, daily sustenance and with our charities with provisions uh, due to the fact that these people are able to spend their resources and energy and time and in fact to an extent even finances just to provide food for the needy. And, you know, it, we cannot do this without this, the support of the, our volunteers. So we are heart and soul, but you know, uh, we are we do have plans to expand operations and and work in a, in a manner in which an organization should be working uh, providing safety and uh, you know safety nets uh, social security nets for our our uh, workers as well so it is it, a matter of just balancing the you know the full-time staff and also our volunteers such as 
small organization of permanent employees, but relying extensively on information <coughs> about 200 active volunteers. That is fantastic. Now we have this COVID-19 pandemic hits, and in the interest of public health, uh, the government announces movement control order, which in my opinion is quite necessary and has done really uh, well. It has really helped Malaysia. But what that means is that now people cannot leave their homes. And your volunteers, they have to sit at home. So how did this, if you could just briefly describe, how did the MCO affect your operations? And what were you able to do to get over that hurdle, that shock that was caused by the MCO? The, the MCO is rather, um, and, and I think the MCO, as mentioned, is really important for us as well. We, we do not want our food and our beneficiaries to be exposed to uh, health and security issues uh, when it comes to you know just food handling. So we, we recognize the importance of the MCO itself, but we do have to kind of manage through it. Um, so we've had to shift our operations. Uh, good thing is very dynamic in terms of how we do our operations. So we did rely a lot on our uh, volunteers previously. We had to phase them out over, over a period of the MCO itself uh, as, as, uh, the, as the conditions get, got stricter over the period and um, but we've managed to kind of do it due to the fact that we we do have our own trucks we do have our staff we were able to uh, we were we have been able to kind of hire more part-time drivers as well and part-time hires to help pick up and uh, items we do have our volunteers still helping out sorting food uh, in our warehouse but we've limited the number we develop our own um, SOPs, crisis SOPs, to ensure that we adhere to WHO and uh, the Ministry of Health recommendations with regard to social distancing, with regard to handling of, uh, you know, uh, surfaces and contamination and so on and so forth. So this, this uh, SOP was developed very early on in the MCO, the first week in fact, and it was distributed to our charities and our food partners and all, so that everyone adheres to the same uh, SOPs. When when the MCO happened, um, again, we had to phase out our uh, volunteers. Uh, we also wanted to ensure that those volunteers who actually helped out still, that were kind of um, incentivized and, and provided with a, a, a critical allowance, for example, but this was also phased out after a period when we found out that um, we need a more secure kind of operational system. So we engage with delivery partners, for example. So now we have professional delivery partners um, helping us out for uh, for free. It's almost like it's their CSR, for example. And the likes of Lala Move, Easy How, Impact, uh, Kita Hanta, Delivery, has, uh, and you know, Skynet uh, has been very helpful during this period. They help us send um, our food and goods. Uh, they help us pick up our food and goods. We also have restaurant partners now, which we never had before. These restaurant partners are basically restaurants uh, cooking fresh cooked meals, uh, which we send to our ch some of our charities. So we previously, before the COVID-19 pandemic, we never dealt with uh, cooked food before so we have had to change that and our restaurant partners have been very helpful providing meals to our partners uh, to our charities um, you know up until the, the second phase of the MCO for example we provided more than 13,000 cooked meals to our charities and uh, thanks to our delivery partners and also our restaurant partners we were able to pick, um, prepare these meals and deliver the food to our to, to the charities. Um, we've also had to kind of change uh, our operational hours. We, we used to work daily and we, we, we kind of cramped that into about two days where we, we, we accept food. But of course, we do accept food on other days as well, but we, we kind of ensure that there is a period whereby people can send food over to our uh, warehouse, uh, for example, those who want to donate food to us. And then we do our distribution weekly as well. We try to time our distribution, um, uh, you know, schedule it strategically so and to ensure that everyone receives their food 
uh, weekly provisions and uh, no one is left out. So certain food are delivered to our charities on Monday and Thursday and they are all the other days we try to deliver to our V40 communities uh, in the uh, in cluster homes and PPRs and local housing throughout KL. So changes are made, changes were made. Uh, we've had to had to adhere to more stricter policies and stricter, SO, stricter SOPs but um, people are just very understanding and people are just able to kind of understand the need for the, the, the operational kind of um, uh, operational dynamics that are needed during this time of uh, crisis. See, as what is interesting here is that uh, because the individual volunteers who were supporting of your operations, once they were not able to come out and help you after the MCO, you were able to switch gears and instead of individual volunteers, you went back, you went to the companies and now you're using uh, or relying on the CSR, the corporate social responsibility activities of these companies to fill in that void that was created by MCO. So now that you have taken all these steps, you have adapted your supply network in response to the shock caused by the MCO. What do you think you will do differently once the MCO is over and you are possibly able to resume your kind of normal operations? Do you think you will go back to how things were six weeks or eight weeks ago? Or do you think uh, the Lost Food Project will operate in a slightly different way? That that is a very good question. Um, we've been over it uh, over the past two weeks at least, uh, trying to strategically, um, you know, uh, think about what we need to do after the MCO because we've been operating somewhat differently in the sense that we've not been collecting surplus food anymore. We we've been buying food in fact, and we've been getting a lot of support from manufacturers, and we've been using professional delivery um, services as well. So I think ideally we want to balance that post um, MCO, whereby we still need we still go back to collecting surplus food, which has been our core uh, messaging from the early beginning. You know, our own tagline is uh, "Feed the hungry, not the landfill." So we do need to go back to s s saving food, um, getting food from the likes of Pasaporong Kuala Lumpur and manufacturers and. Uh, supermarkets and all, but at the same time, we are, we are planning to kind of expand our beneficiary base. We would like to provide to more charities and we would like to provide to more V40 communities, and this requires a lot more uh, strategic operations in the sense that what we were getting previously was not enough to provide for everyone. Um, but with greater funding, we've even we've been able to kind of buy food. So how do we then? Um, engage our wholesalers and manufacturers in terms of uh, providing the surplus food from them and also how do we cater to more people uh, moving forward. So um, yes, the, the dynamics might change a little bit. We've learned a lot throughout this MCO period in terms of what we can provide, uh, our capacity in terms of uh, expanding our, our operational um, dynamics have also changed and we've seen what we can do in very limited circumstances and this might bode well for us just moving forward in terms of uh, how we can expand our operations. We do realize that we need to add more stuff in uh, and we do need to, to source for more food and we do need to kind of balance out how we approach manufacturers and wholesalers and supply, suppliers uh, in terms of providing food. And I know this, this, uh, it's still in the works. We, we do not know what's out there yet after the MCO. We understand that food insecurity will always become an issue. We also realize that the, the supply chain the supply chain has been affected quite um, dearly among the manufacturers and the, 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 the food suppliers. So do we do need to take into cognizance in terms of uh, how it, that will affect what we receive uh, post COVID nineteen, so it'll, it'll be it'll be a, it won't be a massive change in terms of how we operate. We want to, of course, keep the cost down. We would like to move away from buying food if possible. Um, if, before the COVID nineteen situation, we were providing 
food at the rate of one ringgit for every five meals. So if you donate twenty ringgit, we can provide hundred meals to uh, the families and charities. But it has changed a little following the pandemic situation, where we have had to buy food, and uh, the cost has increased quite a bit. So we would like to keep the cost down. Um, we would like to, you know, and that can only be done if we get more food. We can source for more goods and um, provide for more beneficiaries with the amount with the same cost that we are providing now. Um, so yeah, that that's that balance that we need to kind of meet, and we have to think strategically how to to do that. Uh, probably have a lot more talks with our charity and food partners as well. Uh, in all of this, I think if I would want to point out one thing is just adapting so quickly to a big shock like this, switching from uh, your operations base completely from a large group of volunteers to a bunch of companies, and while keeping up with the mission of the of the NGO, the charitable work that you're doing, to keeping the cost down, it is not an easy job. It does speak to your leadership abilities, qualities as well in this. And so thank you very much for all this great work you are doing. Thank you also for sharing about uh, information about your website and Instagram and how people can contribute to your work. And I hope some of our listeners will take some time and they can uh, contribute in whatever way they can. So Seyad, uh, thank you very much for your time. I really appreciate it, especially at this time when you are busy and dealing with several emergencies and challenges, but I appreciate your time for speaking with me. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you again, Chadu, for having me, and uh, thank you, Missy, for, for organizing this. I think um, right now we do need the, 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 the outreach in terms of just the messaging, and we do need pe the people's support. We, we appreciate everyone who has supported us and to those who like to do more and to, to help us with our operations and all. Uh, we welcome them. We always uh, open with open arms. We we accept any kind of uh, support, be it uh, donation or food donation or even you know just moral support. We we are truly thankful for everyone's uh, kind heartedness during this period, and hopefully we can you know um, optimize all the support and uh, you know it translates to people getting food on their table. <laughs>